Slap some bacon on a biscuit and let's go. We're burning daylight. Welcome to the Frontier Freedom Hour with Jeff Hunt. Sponsored by Centennial Institute at Colorado Christian University. Now, here's Jeff Hunt. Friends, welcome to another week of the Frontier Freedom Hour. I'm the chief wagon boss of this operation, Jeff Hunt. Running the board for us, Michael Geronimo Arpaio. We used to call him Deadshot because he got it done every single time. And then I found out he has his own actual nickname from his days in radio. So uh, we'll go with either Geronimo or Deadshot, but he is the consummate professional. Uh, Always doing a great job here at Salem. We're grateful to be able to partner with them. Wonderful organization. If you're listening to us for the first time, we cover issues facing the Western United States from a Christian conservative perspective. We're thankful we're not getting all the government we are paying for. Joining me in studio this week, Sean Nation, Deputy General Counsel for Mountain States Legal Foundation. Sean Nation uh, focuses on defending individual liberty. A native of Georgia, he attended Emory University and is undergraduate in New York University School of Law. NYU! That's that's next level, man. While at NYU, he helped found the Journal of Law and Liberty, the first student-edited law journal dedicated to the critical exploration of classical liberal ideas. He has dedicated his career to helping individuals recover damages in class and collective actions. He is admitted to practice both here in New York and Georgia, or New York and Georgia, as well as various federal courts. Do you practice here in Colorado, I'm guessing, right? Uh, so I'm not yet admitted to the state of Colorado. Um, I've uh, kind of let that process go because my practice is mostly federal. So, oh, yeah, federal. Um, yeah, I'm yeah. admitted to the federal court here. But um, it, it, if I'm in state court, I, I'm probably in trouble. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, not, uh, not something I've really pursued. All right, so Sean is going to be the uh, feature speaker at our Constitution Day celebration happening at Colorado Christian University this Monday. If you're interested in attending that, you go to centennial.ccu.edu, centennial.ccu.edu. Click on the events tab there and go to our issue forums. We try to do this regularly, but every year we like to celebrate the Constitution. You may not know this, but... At Colorado Christian University, it is a strategic priority to impact our culture in support of the original intent of the Constitution. Yes, you heard that. We are not trying to bring in new ideas to the Constitution, that it's a living document, breathing document that can be changed and altered by the whims of whatever day, age happens to be around. We believe that there are essential principles baked into the Constitution that should be defended from the First Amendment, Second Amendment, all the way through to the setup of our government, the structure of our government, all that's important and should be defended. So at Colorado Christian University, I know you think most universities out there are woke. You actually have one of the top 10 most conservative schools in America right here in Denver, Colorado, and they're going to be celebrating Constitution Day September 18th from 6.30 to 8. Featured speaker is Sean Nation. So, Sean, tell us a little bit first about the work of Mountain States Legal Foundation. You guys are a godsend, just freedom-loving people in the state of Colorado. Yes. Yeah, so, Mountain States, uh, the Mountain States Legal Foundation, we're dedicated to preserving liberty, uh, individual liberty. We are a particular focus. Uh, is typically on the first, second, uh, first and second amendments, the equal protection clause of the Fourteenth Amendment, um, which we can get into, and of course land use and and property rights, which is uh, a huge thing uh, in the West. You know, when, like you said, I grew up in Georgia. Um, not a lot of federal land in Georgia. Uh, <laughs> you come out west, and it's kind of a shocking amount of federal land. And you know, you can talk about positives and you know what benefits that might have but at the same time you're locking up a lot of land a lot of minerals a lot of oil and gas that this country could use and and depending on the administration quite frankly uh, sometimes we get to use it and then sometimes we don't Um, so part of our mission at mountain states is to apply a consistent approach across administrations uh, so that you don't get these whiplashes of oh all of a sudden you're you're um, your your uh, drilling well, right. your drilling lease is canceled because uh, President Biden came into office, <laughs> but you know oh oh we're going to reinstate it because hopefully a you know a different administration comes in in twenty twenty four. 
what we really want is that kind of consistency, right? And and we think not only, you know, law generally, general principles, but the Constitution demands that. Well, and, and I sit on the board of American Lands Council. For us, consistency is giving it back to the states. I, you know, I, they, yep. they, every other state has pretty much got the federal land that they had when they came in um, to the union, right? As you're, you're a state, you come into the union. A lot of the land belongs to the federal government. And over time, it's given back to the states. And the states can do what they want. You, you want to lease it out to oil and gas? You want to create a state park? We don't care. States have control of it. Except for the West, where it's the federal government's like, nah, we live 2,000 miles away that way. But we're still going to control what you can do with your own land. Yeah, I mean, it's and crazy. I completely agree that it's a problem. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't – various good-hearted people can come up with different solutions. I think returning it to state control is, is a perfectly viable one. Um, I don't know – if we'll ever get there, I hope we do. Yep. But uh, I think generally, um, at, at a minimum, a, a consistent approach uh, that we can all kind of agree to uh, would be uh, better than the current system. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm giving a talk on on Monday um, celebrating the Constitution, and it's I think we just decided it was a 235th anniversary. Of Depending on, on when you determine it, because it was written in 1787, ratified in 1788, and in operation since 1789. So, now, yes. I kind of I kind of like that. It took that while for the government to get stuff done. Um, slow would be nice. Three years for the government to do stuff would be good. Well, and, and you know, you keep in mind during that three years, you also had um, James Madison writing the right. Federalist Papers, right. you know, writing these great tracks of documents, um, kind of telling uh, the American people and, and really working to convince the American people that a stronger federal government was necessary compared to, um, you know, the prior regime, which had a very weak federal government. I think, I think we're probably in agreement that the balance has gone a little too <laughs> one direction, right? a little too far. And people forget that they forget there, there was a lot of you had like interstate tariff wars that were yep. taking place, and no one really wanted to fund the military, and so you had really serious issues when you gave. Just purely individual states, almost too much power. Exactly. And, you know, when you're thinking about uh, the late 18th century, so the, you know, the 1780s, what are we going to do? We've got these new 13 states that just won this war against uh, the world's superpower at the time, you know, the, the, that Great Britain. And you're trying to figure out how are we going to structure a government, a republic that has never really existed before. You know, there were some early Dutch experiments. There were some, some you know, you can call back to ancient Rome. But at the time in the late 18th century, there wasn't a republic that – and just so everyone's aware, a republic is a state without a monarch – Right. The model at the time was monarchy and a strong, uh, a strong king, even in Britain at the time, though the, the monarch wasn't as strong as it had been, say, 150 years earlier. It was still a very strong yep. monarchy. It controlled the it can control this. If you go back to the Declaration of Independence, right, mm -hmm. it can con it essentially paid for all the judges. Mm -hmm. So you have control of that. Imagine Joe Biden's writing the check to every single judge out there. Yeah, I think they're probably going to rule in Joe Biden's favor. Um, or uh, they could disband legislatures yep. if they wanted to. And, and at the same time, they could dictate where those legislative districts were. So mm -hmm. London, I think, had you know two or three representatives. And Old Sarum, which is basically where Stonehenge is, had one representative, and nobody lived there. So, you know, it was what w would later be called the rotten borough system. So it wasn't as though there were actually a, a representative style of democracy. It was the king could, could, could grant representation to wherever he wanted. Mm -hmm. So he got to choose, essentially. And it built up over time, of course, but... Um, the king got to decide who was in parliament, more or less. There was some back and forth, but you know it was still the, a monarchical system. So 
you know, Washington, Jefferson, uh, Madison, Monroe, they didn't have a, a system to, to model off her. They uh, had some theorists like Montesquieu, who they very much um, uh, decided they wanted to look at. And, and, but what they ultimately created was the separation of powers so that we didn't have a, a strong central figure at the time. We've kind of gotten away from that, and, and that's one thing that we at Mountain States are fighting against, is to make sure that we still have this separation of powers. Right, right. Because uh, you can look at – there's a, a case coming up uh, called Loper Bright that we, we have written on, and it's about how does a federal agency get to determine its own rules – and Chevron deference. Exactly. Yeah, the Chevron case from the ni- from nineteen eighty four. That's a four letter word to most of us. Yeah. So And we're up against a break oh. here. We got about a minute left, I think. So maybe we can get uh into it in just a second. Give people a quick overview and then we'll get into it more in the next segment. So the the case itself uh, arises out of an agency action where it determined its own rules. And we the government determines its own rules exactly, and so what we there's no problem with that. What we are what we have written and and submitted to the court is that uh, the Chevron deference regime, whether it goes away or not, should be limited, and the agency shouldn't be allowed to make up its own rules. We're going to cover that and more when we return. You're listening to the Frontier Freedom Hour. Jeff Hunt here interviewing Sean Nation from Mountain State's Legal Foundation. You're not going to want to miss it. We're celebrating the Constitution. Yeehaw! We'll be right back. 